as at this time we will commence military honors. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are here to honor Dr. Wareham. Today's military honors will consist of the sounding of taps, the unfolding and folding of the American flag and presented to you, ma'am. During the sounding of taps, if there's any amongst us that are currently serving or have served in the United States military, out of respect for our fallen comrade, please render one final hand salute. All others, you may respectfully place your right hand over your heart. At this time, if you are able, please rise for military honors.
I extend heartfelt and sincere regrets on behalf of Dr. Hart. Weather patterns and flight delays have prohibited his participation today in a most important event. The Old Testament king, David, at a particularly painful time in his life, spoke to those who served him in 2 Samuel chapter 3. The words are recorded. And the king said to his servants, Do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? Such words could very well have been penned about the gentleman whose life we come to mourn and to celebrate. It's truly a sacred privilege and an honor for me on behalf of the family to extend to you a welcome to this most important event. Such times are never easy, but they do call us to ponder and to reflect. And on this day, we have the privilege of pondering and reflecting on a life truly well lived. I read to you from the last book in Scripture, from the next to last chapter in the sacred account, the words of John the Revelator. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is with mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Would you pray with me? God of infinite grace, we come here with a bittersweet mixture of emotions. We come here with understandable pride in having known and having had a part in the life of Dr. Ellsworth Wareham. We come with memories of a gentleman who served, who made a difference, who changed lives, and one who left very large footprints here in Loma Linda and around the world. But we also have feelings of sorrow and sadness. For when we come to the moment when we face our mortality, there is always an emptiness left behind. We pray then that the presence of your Holy Spirit would be felt as a source of comfort and hope and blessing. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. Beaten, weary, left along the way Dry from thirst till word I could not say Then you came walking by And looked into my eyes And saw my need and stopped to rescue me 
Others came and others went on by Refused to help or just to tire to try Alone at last I sat And I fell my head back And words from deep within me touched the sky I'm hungry, please feed me I'm naked, please clothe me I'm so alone, won't someone come to me? The sound of my words died Oh well, at least I tried And trying seemed the only I stopped and you were there And then I knew that God had heard my prayer I should have realized And not have been surprised His eyes on the sparrow So why not me? And we left along the way Dry from thirst till a word I could not say Then you came walking by And looked into my eyes And saw my need and stopped to rescue me You came walking by and looked into my eyes and saw my need and stopped to rescue me. On behalf of Mom and our entire family, uh, we appreciate your presence and your support uh, to help us honor and celebrate Dad's life today. It's interesting, um, Mom and Dad had talked about writing their life sketches for quite a few years, and it wasn't until last week when she was going through some items in an old chest that she found some of his notes. And on one of the notepads, in his neat, small little print, it said, Final Draft Life Sketch. And so Mom has asked me to recite this verbatim, word for word. And so typical of Dad, he always talked in the third person about himself. It was never I or me. It's always him, Ellsworth, Wareham. And I'm going to recite it right now the way he wrote it. He wrote this, it was dated August 16th, 2010, so that's a year after he retired. Ellsworth Wareham was born on a small peanut farm in northeastern Texas, about 10 miles north of the historic town of Jefferson. When he was six years old, the family moved to central Alberta, Canada, where they would become grain farmers. His father built a log house fences, and cleared the land for cultivation. There was no electricity, gas, or plumbing. The school was one room with one teacher who taught eight grades. There were 10 students. His parents were of limited education, but his mother, who was a devout Adventist Christian, encouraged her six children to get a good education. Three brothers became dentists, and his two sisters received degrees in nursing. 
It was during the Great Depression of the early 30s and money was very scarce. His Czechoslovakian grandmother gave him $300 for his first year at Canadian Junior College. The remainder of his education, including medicine, he paid for himself. Because of the lack of finances, he was out of school for three years during this time. There were no government education loans and little school loan assistance in those days. His early, rather arduous life made him very frugal. And in later years, he would say, quotes, I never part with a dime without a little struggle. It was during these trying days when the future seemed so dark and uncertain that Wareham was impressed with the promise found in the Bible, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Verse 6, in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. In looking back over his life, Wareham said, quote, I did not fulfill my part of the bargain completely to acknowledge God in all my ways, but God fulfilled his part of the promise anyway. In preparing for his life work, it was always clear to him what he should do. When he was 19, there came a time when he had a powerful impression that he should take medicine. He recalled it very vividly. There was never any doubt in his mind that he was to be a doctor. He graduated from Loma Linda, and during his training, Pearl Harbor occurred December 7, 1941. He was not accepted in, into the armed services at that time due to an illness that left an abnormal laboratory blood value. A platinum mine in Alaska located on the Bering Sea needed a physician, so he took that position um, as their physician. This mine produced 90% of the world's iridium, which was used in making magneto points for aircraft engines. And so the mine was considered very essential to the war effort. In 1944, as World War II reached its crescendo, Wareham felt he should be involved in something so momentous. He obtained his release from the platinum mine, returned to the US, passed his physical exam for the Navy this time, and within three weeks was in the Western Pacific as a medical officer aboard a destroyer. He always felt honored to have spent two years as a part of the great U.S. Navy. Now, there were few well-trained surgeons in those days, and the Navy was no exception. The captain of Wareham's ship lost his life because of mismanagement following an abdominal injury. The surgeons on the Seventh Fleet Hospital ship failed to diagnose a ruptured jejunum. This experience further impressed him to get training in surgery when he left the Navy. His first, year, uh, first three years in surgery training were in Southern California. It was in Glendale he met a very slender and rather tall red-headed student nurse by the name of Barbara Nell Nix. She would later say, quotes, how could two people get married who were such opposites, end of quotes. And he would reply, quotes, because we need each other to be complete, and you bring great beauty into my life. Upon her graduation in 1950, they married and left immediately for New York, where they would be for five years, having three of their five children, and he would finish his residency training. In New York, during his senior year of residency in thoracic surgery, in April of 1953, a Dr. Gibbon in Philadelphia performed the first open heart surgery using a heart-lung machine. Ellsworth Wareham knew he must be involved in this new specialty. Again, it was a very strong conviction, so he extended his res residency training another 18 months to study the new field of open heart surgery. While in this training, he was a pediatric heart surgery resident 
and his hospital sent him to visit centers where the new specialty was developing. Universities in Colorado, Minnesota, and Toronto in order to get additional experience. Interestingly, Dr. Gibbon in Philadelphia stopped doing any more open heart cases when his next two patients died. But in July of 1955, Wareham returned to join the School of Medicine in the Los Angeles Division and started an open heart surgery program and in 1964, when the School of Medicine united on the Loma Linda campus, he moved there. He was especially proud of the men who trained in Loma Linda's cardiothoracic surgery fellowship program. He frequently said they rank with the very best. In their communities, they are outstanding surgeons. In the academic field, Dr. Leonard Bailey introduced and made Loma Linda a leader in pediatric cardiac transplantation. And Dr. Glenn Van Arsdale became chief of pediatric surgery at the prestigious Toronto Sick Children's Hospital. In 1963, Drs. Coggin and Wareham organized the Loma Linda Overseas Heart Surgery Team. It was sponsored by then Vice President Lyndon Johnson through the State Department to go to Karachi, Pakistan. In subsequent years, trips were made to other countries where open heart surgery was not being done or to assist in programs that were just starting. In two countries, Greece and Saudi Arabia, large permanent programs were started. And in Athens, the noted shipping magnate Aristotle Onassis built an ultra-modern cardiac hospital where 2,000 heart surgeries are performed yearly. Sent by the heart surgery team, many hundreds of Loma Linda doctors, medical students, technicians, and nurses have served overseas, and medical personnel from these countries have come to Loma Linda for additional training. People who have gone abroad with the heart surgery team have found it to be an exhilarating and delightful experience. The heart patients overseas were mostly poor, and since heart surgery was not available in their country, and they did not have money to go abroad, there was no hope for them. And Dad completed this last part, this last remaining um, paragraph. I don't know if he intended to do further, but he ended it this way. Of the heart teams overseas, Ellsworth would say, quote, there is no compensation equal to the enjoyment of caring for people who would live disabled lives and die prematurely if not operated upon. The profound gratitude expressed by patients and their families was reward beyond compensation.
A few years ago, I made it a point to go to my grandmother and say, should and when the time comes, I would like to speak. I'm going to ask your forgiveness because I know that for most, uh, you never see a Marine cry. It's a chip they give to us. They install it during training. But I don't know that it's going to work today. So I ask your forgiveness as I go forward. And know that there's a few men in this world that would cause such a reaction. I ask to speak because there are many people, a very large list of people for whom I wear this uniform. But there's a very short list of people without which in my life I would have never dared to seek such an honor. I would have never believed myself capable of doing such a thing. And my grandfather, Ellsworth Wareham, I knew him as Grumps. It's not because of any particular negative issue by any means, but as a child, I looked at a man with such an expression, and it seemed to fit. And since that time, it became a moniker of kind of bizarre joy to call such a great man Grumps. But without Grumps setting my compass, setting my standard, there's no possible way that I would have earned the honor and title of Marine. And it is important that when people contribute in your life that profoundly, that you stand up publicly and thank them. And so today, today is my thank you. And I was thinking of how to pay tribute to such a man and the magnitude of that responsibility for a man, as we all know, accomplished more than 
any of us really seek to do. But as I was thinking about it, I settled on the idea that the most important thing for me would be to share who, to share the lessons that Grumps provided in living his life the way that he did. Not the lessons that he necessarily said out loud, although there were many. Any of us that knew him and sat for more than a few minutes could have taken out a notebook as he began to speak and written down about nine or ten principles within about the first 15 minutes that we would never want to forget. But in the Marine Corps, we have an ideal of leadership that we live by expressed in a Latin phrase, ductus exemplo, lead by example. And so I thought the best thing I could do, the thing I wanted to do the most, is try to encapsulate at least five lessons that I watched and learned through his example that he may not have known he was necessarily sharing, although I'm pretty sure he did, and pass those on to others, and especially to my children who are sitting at home watching this right now. So to Addie, Emmy, and Jax, and for those of us here, I'd like to start with lesson one. This is probably the greatest lesson that he gave me. And I can hear him saying right now, even though he never said this out loud, but when he would extol some sort of virtue, he would always start with, let me tell you, Jason boy, and then at the end of that, drop some knowledge. So I can, I can hear him saying this right now. Lesson one, there is no room in life for self-pity. No matter what story he told me, no matter how dire the circumstances were, and you heard in that life scan, uh, there was much of his life where he had nothing or next to nothing but a goal and ideal. He would talk to me about having slept out near the railroad ties during much of his education, functionally homeless. And he wouldn't talk to me the way that people would relate those kind of stories today, as in, oh, woe is me. I was so struggling. But rather, he would talk in a emotionless recitation of fact as if it was meaningless. It was just part of the overall makeup. He would share stories with me, especially after I had joined the profession of arms, of the military and what he had gone through in some of those environments in World War II, as if they were as much entertainment as anything else. And so from that, I learned and I try as much as possible to remind myself that there is no room in life for self-pity. Lesson two, it is not the measure of your deeds that define you, but the measure of the investment you place in others. I don't have to tell you how important it was to him, not what he did, not what he accomplished, but in the people he trained, in the people he led. I don't have to tell this room specifically that there was very few times where his grump's demeanor would brighten quite as quickly as when he was discussing the people that he got to work with and the people that he got to train. If you could get him on one of those stories, you would need to settle in because you weren't going anywhere for a while. And I know, I know that this room feels the investment that he put in you, that he placed in you. And I hope to God every day that I am able to produce a sufficient return on the investment that he put in me. Lesson three, go into any task or purpose 
with unassailable confidence that you are up to whatever is going to be asked of you. I've spoken to nurses and doctors that worked with him over time. And was actually just talking about this with my grandmother yesterday. That I, I'm not sure quite where he got it, but in everything that he did, he knew he was going to succeed. There was no question. There was no deliberation. There was no worry. There was no concern. He would just do it. Whether he be a hundred and mending his own fence while I stood there shocked, concerned, and dismayed that the fence might fall on him, as he did literally anything, he did it unconcerned that he would fail. And in fact, I find it interesting that my grandmother provided me this to confirm this point, this handwritten set of notes from 1979, he wrote on the back of an antique invite, where he said, specifically, dispense with fear and timidity and concern and indecision that your actions will fail. I found that yesterday. I wrote this weeks ago. So if we need any confirmation of what he intended to share with us through his actions, there you are. Lesson four. At times, you will fail to live up to your own standards or character, but those failures do not define you. I don't know that many of us in this room are accustomed to ever seeing my grandfather fail. But it was in the last few years of his life that he, when I got the chance to sit down with him, and I think having the uniform had something to do with it, he opened up a bit more and shared with me at times when he had failed and had not lived up to his standards. But he said, why would I concern myself with that? Why would I let that interfere with today? You've just got to keep pushing and keep going. And again, in this letter, specifically, you need to polish up those rough places of your character and continue to do good. Lesson five, and the final one I want to share today, and one that has specific bearing and meaning on my life and in my life at times is that a boldly lived life inspires others to live boldly. It was August 1, 1945, when he was aboard the USS Connor, a destroyer in World War II in the Pacific, when he was called upon to board a Japanese vessel what would prove to be the only Japanese vessel sailed while, or, or seized while under sail during the entire war. And he jumped, the naval doctor, the non-combatant, jumped in with a detail of Marines and assisted in inspecting a purported hospital ship that was in fact carrying troops and ammunition. He would tell me this story, again, not concerned with much fear, but I did ask him, I said, weren't you concerned? Weren't you, weren't you afraid? And he said, well, you know, Jason Boy, it's not a lot of time to think about that in the moment, and I suppose I was, but I wasn't going to tell anyone. And why this matters to me, how this played out in my life, and why I need to remind all of you that we must live bold lives and inspire boldness in others is because in 2010, when I deployed to Afghanistan, there were times when I was afraid. There was one specific night when we were on our way to attack an enemy location. We were traveling along a very narrow route uh, where on the left side 
there was a steep cliff, and on the right side, a steep mountain. Uh, when our convoy broke down. Now, I, as the battalion's lawyer, if you didn't know, I'm a judge advocate for the Marine Corps. We deploy down to the tactical level, because that's what Marines do. I, as the judge advocate, was part of the headquarters element, and my commander, when we broke down, decided that he was going to continue to push forward. But I was behind several miles in the convoy. And my battalion CO came across the radio and said, Hey, Warhammer. Wareham, Warhammer, it worked out. Hey, Warhammer, I need you to get up here in my Vic right away. Well, of course, I said, aye, sir, and got moving. And it wasn't until I stepped outside and realized that I had about a mile to two mile run with all of my gear on a narrow strip in a country where the roads explode that this could get a lot more interesting a lot faster. And not that I let anybody know at the time, but there was a part of me that didn't want to take the first step, didn't want to go on that run. And I remember, Grumps telling me, there's not a lot of time for fear. And I swear, he was with me every step of that run. It was that picture in his uniform in my mind as I took off. He was right there. In every step until I got where I was going, and we did our job, and I came home. He was there inspiring me to act and live boldly. Now, what I was planning is to be done at that point, but my cousin sent me a quote that he had handwritten in one of his Bibles just yesterday as well. And when I read this, a quote from George Bernard Shaw, I didn't think there was much of a better recitation that Grumps would have given if he wanted to define his life in total. So I guess this is lesson six in a sense. This is the true joy in life. The being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. The being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish, little clod of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community, and as long as I live it, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die, for the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle for me. It is a sort of splendid torch, which I have got hold of for the moment, and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. There's really no better description of what Grumps has done for all of us. And so, Grumps, and in some cases by some called Duda, although I reject that premise, Doctor, Lieutenant, Wareham, Fair Winds and Following Seas, Lieutenant, you stand relieved, sir. We have the watch. We will pass on the torch.
nearly six decades ago, Dr. Wareham founded the cardiac surgery program at Loma Linda University. His pioneering work and courage inspired hundreds of students, and dozens of them went on to train and do a cardiac surgery as their career. We are deeply indebted to Dr. Wareham's leadership and vision. Thank you, Mrs. Wareham. Thank you, the family of Dr. Wareham, for sharing him with us, and yes, for letting him invest in us. One very grateful student of Dr. Wareham's is Leonard Bailey. It is my honor today to deliver his words that he entitled A Brief Tribute to Dr. Wareham. The physician and philosopher William Osler could have had Ellsworth Worm in mind when he wrote. You know him here as a staunch colleague, a devoted teacher, and an enthusiastic supporter of this school and hospital. You may not reach so high in the mountains as he has, but your life may be as satisfactory and as perfect if lived as his in the service of the profession and of his fellow men. Dr. Wareham graduated from the College of Medical Evangelists in 1942, the year I was born. He became a naval officer in the Pacific Fleet. His captain, a year younger than he, referred to him as surgeon. Surgeon became the story of his life. During training, he met and married a beautiful red-headed girl from Texas. And together, they went to New York City to begin creating a family and to get additional training in the very new specialty of thoracic surgery. They returned to the Loma Linda faculty to begin the heart surgery program for this school. Dr. Wareham became one of the great leaders of heart surgery in America. Beyond that, he demonstrated with the help of Dr. John Coggin and young Dr. Wilfred Hughes that heart surgery could be made portable and could be accomplished abroad in developing areas of the world with outcomes equivalent to those experienced here in this country. I remember him saying once that in those early days of developing the program in Los Angeles, the patients were so sick that the day they were scheduled for valve replacement was frequently the day they died. Nevertheless, success, as Winston Churchill said, success is the ability to go from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. There was clearly no lack of enthusiasm on Wareham's part. Very quickly, the day they scheduled someone for valve replacement, was the day that person got a new life. By and by, their surgery extended to the Loma Linda campus. 
I recall as a freshman medical student observing heart surgery in the Loma Linda Hill Hospital back in 1965. Eventually, the heart surgery program was moved to the Loma Linda campus and thereafter was based in the beautiful new medical center at Loma Linda. Dr. Wareham's impact on my life has been profound. He is a major reason why I chose the specialty of heart surgery. He groomed me as a student in the laboratory, as a surgical resident, and during our trips together in developing areas of the world. When I was operating, with him assisting, I felt safe. It seemed nothing was too grievous when he was there helping. He taught me resiliency and humility and a sense of equanimity, all features he embodied so well as a professor, as a professor of surgery and as a gentleman. I couldn't help but love him. Ellsworth's worm was capable of many aphorisms, two of which come to mind. Cardiac surgery is a few steps done well. And secondly, there's always room for a good one, speaking of a place for a young trainee to find work. Dr. Wareham was an individual of great stature, a durable friend, and professional. He was an aristocrat, one of a handful of noble pioneers in cardiac surgery. He was timeless, ageless, and truly one of a kind, signed Len Bailey. I find it hard to believe there, that there isn't something for everybody. In other words, there's some particular line of work that they ought to be in. I hope they found it. When I was about 19 or 20, I, I had a very definite impression come over me that I should be a doctor. My dad was a peanut farmer. He, he, he was not a big scale peanut farmer, he was a small scale peanut farmer. I earned my money going to school by working in the, in the summertime. I was fortunate when I was a, a resident to have a chief in New York who believed in giving residents lots of responsibility early on. It's one thing to have the theory, it's another thing to actually be doing the procedure. And you have to do the procedure to have the confidence, and that's what makes a, a strong surgeon. I saw the great advantage of it, and I used the same principle in our training program. It just wasn't that you were a general surgeon, you'd be a general and a cardiothoracic surgeon. And for about 15 years, Everybody in Loma Linda that was trained in the program was trained in both. And of course, Bailey is a, one of those fellows. If you just reflect on it even slightly, you can see that the greatest contribution that you can make is to train other people to do what you do. In the early days, heart surgery was um, noteworthy because it was unique and done only in a few countries in the world. And it attracted the attention of everybody, including chiefs of state. It never occurred to me that uh, I would be connected to Lyndon Johnson and uh, go overseas and do heart surgery, say, until it actually happened. Those countries, all those children needed heart surgery and nobody didn't do it. 
So their very lives depended upon it. It's something when you are able to perform uh, an operation and save the life of a child and they have no choice otherwise. You see, they'll die. Puts in a different category altogether. I'm going to be 100 years old, so that's attracting some attention, because I'm going to be 100 years old. But I'll tell you what's important. An Adventist vegetarian male will outlive a male in the general population by how much? Nine and a half years, 9.5 years. For a woman, it's 6.1, a little less. Now, I think that that's the most outstanding bit of information that I know of as far as healthful living. 94-year-old adventist Dr. Ellsworth Wareham can still be found in the operating room. He still does open-heart surgery. He's an amazing guy. For Dr. Wareham, that means a vegan diet. Uh, I have never cared for animal products, and when I found out I didn't need them, they were out the door. <laughs> no, I never uh, I made any, uh, let us say, plan or effort for longevity. I decided when I was 92 or 3 that I, that I won't keep going forever. I'll quit at 95. It's fun doing surgery, you know, I mean, just dissecting things out. And, and uh, some things can get pretty complicated. And, there's a satisfaction in order. It's something you can see. I appreciate the great influence of Loma Linda as a spiritual institution. You know, the fact that it's not only the intellect, but also the spirit. I'm an individual who enjoyed what he's doing and had the opportunity, the opportunity to continue it. But I am a great believer in the spiritual realm and in God's guidance and in his blessing. I first met Dr. Wareham in 1966. I was a student nurse at the Sydney Adventist Hospital, and I met him through the pages of a little book called The Heartbenders. It was um, through that book that I was inspired a few years later when I graduated to do a course in cardiothoracic nursing. And in that kind of nursing, I found something I could be passionate about for the rest of my life. Fast forward to 1974. I was doing a short-term mission stint in Vietnam, and I heard their heart team was coming, and I was thrilled to think that I would meet them at last. We worked hard and fast. We did four cases a day, uh, six days a week, until we had done 60 patients. I was very overwhelmed at the beginning. I was taught to do vital signs on each patient every 15 minutes um, for the first 24 hours, and there was no way we could keep up that pace. And I shared my concern with Dr. Wareham, and he said in his assuring, booming voice, Jeanette, you could put half these patients under a palm tree for the rest of their stay, and they'd do just fine. <laughs> and they did. Being on the heart team brought so many opportunities to many of us. We were able to travel, to broaden our minds, and most importantly to me was to make friendships that have lasted a lifetime. Dr. Wareham taught us many things. One of them was professionalism. He always wanted everybody on the team to, to act professionally, to dress professionally. He didn't like gum chewing. He didn't like jeans. He didn't like 
the residents putting their feet up on the end of the bed to write charts when we had hard charts. He had a book when we were in Saudi Arabia called Dress for Success, and he often quoted from that. And he'd be proud of you today, Robert. <laughs> he was always calm in a crisis. While we were in China, the first case um, started off and the power went out. And he said, it's okay, I can see the heart, it's still beating, we're fine. And we were fine. He was a very disciplined person in his own life, especially with his eating habits. He was vegan in, in later years. And he was even featured on National Geographic as an example of one of the Blue Zone people from Loma Linda. Um, but behind every great man is a great woman. And Barbara was a great cook, and she adapted. And you will get a star in your crown when you go to heaven. <laughs> um, some years ago, we were greeting in the breezeway, my husband and I, and two well-dressed ladies came walking up, and I asked them, were they visitors? Yes, they were visiting from Los Angeles. They had seen the Oprah show, and they wanted to meet the Blue Zone, and they wanted to come to the Loma Linda market and meet Dr. Wareham. I said I could help them with Dr. Wareham, but the market was closed that day. So uh, I phoned Dr. Wareham, and he said, take their name and number, and I will get back with them. So a few months later, I invited them and the Werhams and the Hardings as representatives of the Blue Zone to come for lunch. Just before we were about to eat, I had prepared a nice vegan meal. The lady mentioned to me, I only eat raw food. So I hustled into the kitchen and got some more dishes for her to eat. But Barbara saved the day. She came, arrived with two beautiful um, apple pies and ice cream, and the dinner was a success. Dr. Wareham was always a great optimist. He saw life through rose-tinted glasses. Sometimes those glasses were a little blood splattered, and I remember my friend Joyce would take his glasses off, go over to the sink, wash them off, and give them back to him. He also had some famous sayings like, never wrestle with the pigs, you only get dirty and they like it. <laughs> so on behalf of the nurses today, I want to say thank you for Dr. Worm for having us as his nurses, we all learned from him, we all admired him, and we want you to know that, Barbara. He was like a stand-in father for some of us who didn't have a father. Today we come to say good night. Sleep tight. We will see you in the morning. In uh, 1975, uh, Roger Hadley and I were general surgery residents on the cardiac surgery team. Um, our job was to take the vein, uh, hold the heart so that the surgeon could do the bypass, and then we would help close. And Roger and I used to race to see who could get the patient back to the room first. Roger usually won because he worked with Bill Cavan and John Jacobson who were really fast. And sometimes I think that's one of the reasons that Roger's the dean today. <laughs> Actually, something happened on that service that changed my life. We were, on, uh, we were in clinic one day, and I have to admit, I was always in awe of Dr. Wareham. I, kind of stood back from him, and one day he said, Dave, have you ever considered going into cart cardiac surgery? And I was just dumbfounded. I, I really hadn't. Uh, my boyhood dream was to be a center fielder for the New York Yankees, <laughs> but I knew that as an Adventist that would never happen. Plus, I didn't have the athletic ability to do it. But anyway, as a result of that conversation, 
In a few months, my wife and I and my little girl were living in Greece. We worked with the uh, uh, Greek surgeon over there with the Loma Linda Heart Team for three months. I think I told all over Athens. In fact, I have a picture of Greece plastered on my wall now. And then we spent eight wonderful months living in Saudi Arabia and operating on the Saudis. After that, uh, I left Loma Linda. I spent 11 years in North Dakota doing cardiac surgery and, and then the last 22 years in Las Vegas doing cardiac surgery. So never underestimate the power of words. In 1979, my dream was realized. I got into the cardiac surgery program here at Loma Linda. I trained under some really good conscientious surgeons beside Dr. Wareham, Lynn Bailey, uh, John Jacobson, Alfredo Rossi, Ed V. Meister, and Larry Laughlin. I remember the first case that I did I think as you heard Dr. Wareham say, he didn't show you how to do it, you did it, and he was talking you through the case. Um, the only thing I ever remember from him was he was always after me for sewing with the flat of my needle. And uh, he would implore me to watch Bjorn Borg or Jimmy Connors or John McEnroe to see how they did things backhand. Even with uh, the, the yelling and the correction <laughs> that went on, he, he never really belittled us or made us feel small. In fact, oftentimes he would address me as the prophet Daniel did to Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever, <laughs> and then to give the correction. We just... We just never wanted to disappoint him. He, however, could be kind of tough on the anesthesia residents. One of my classmates was doing the anesthesia for us one day, and I'm sure there are anesthesiologists here, and I'm sure you never did this, but when we were on the heart-lung machine, the heart has stopped. It's like being on automatic pilot in some ways. And I've looked over the table sometime, and I see uh, the anesthesiologist snoozing or reading the newspaper. Uh, Dr. Wareham liked to have them involved, and so he was really going after Don about retained secretions, sucking out the endotracheal tube uh, constantly. That went on for most of the case, and then Don got up to leave, and as he was leaving, Dr. Wareham got in one last shot. He said, Don, how can you tell when you're on vacation? <laughs> and without <laughs> batting an eye, Don turned around and said, as soon as I'm out of earshot of your voice. <laughs> <laughs> one day, we were doing a case, and Dr. Wareham was really down on himself. I wasn't quite sure why, but it was very obvious. And into the room walked a, an attending physician from another specialty. He looked on the wall and he looked at the films that we were using to operate on the patient. And he says, Ellsworth, if I were doing this case, this is what I would do. And Dr. Wareham's mood just lifted. And he leaned across the table and he whispered to me, I cried because I had no shoes, and then I met a man with no feet. <laughs> <laughs> Our home base was the unit 7100. Um, it was Looking back on it, it was like magic. Uh, everyone seemed to get along. It, it was a really good team. We really 
uh, had excellent nurses. Uh, Dr. Wareham often said that the success of the program depended so much on them. I never saw him berate or belittle a nurse. Uh, rounds were wonderful. Uh, we did the work, but it's also a time that he interacted with the patient. He could ask them, where are you from? I've never been there, tell me about it. And it was on one such occasion that um, I tricked, or I talked Joyce Johnson into recording one of my favorite stories. Um, I think maybe when you were growing up, you heard the same story from your parents or grandparents, and you knew how it was going to end, but you kept wanting to hear it. And it was a story about the Elks Club. And so Joyce recorded that, and that was 40 years ago. I've never gotten to hear it since then, but she came up with it for this occasion. I think it's going to be on the Loma Linda website, and you've got to hear it. To me, it's sort of like, you know, you can read the Gettysburg Address, but you don't really hear it until you hear Lincoln give it. And having him tell that story is sort of like Lincoln giving the Gettysburg Address. What did I learn from Dr. Wareham? When I was a senior cardiac resident, I'd gone through six years of general surgery, two years of cardiac, and I decided that in December, uh, I wasn't going to take any call. Uh, Dr. Wareham let me know right away that wasn't good. <laughs> Another time we did a, uh, just a conventional coronary artery bypass patient. The patient bled through the night. It was obvious the next day that we were going to have to take him back and find out what was bleeding. There was a really interesting case, though, that was going to go on at the same time. Dr. Wareham said, you can do that case, but your first responsibility is to take care of that patient that you did last night. I learned from him that it's okay uh, to talk to the housekeepers, uh, to the transporters, to know their names. I also learned that it's important to pray for, before you do a case, asking God's help. And then, obviously, it's okay to have a sense of humor. Dr. Wareham once told me, Dave, if you want to really insult somebody, and you're in an argument with them, don't look them in the face when you talk to them. Look at their chest and mispronounce their name. <laughs> I guess lastly, you heard that he was working until um, in his 90s. I don't know if you knew that he was driving down to Cedar sinai and assisting, sometimes coming back at 2 or 3 in the morning. I think Barbara was worried that something was going to happen, a 90-year-old man driving on the freeways at that time. He said, I want to go out in a blaze of glory. I'm sure he meant a one-car crash, because I know he wouldn't have wanted to hurt anyone. It's really nice every once in a while, even in Las Vegas, as big a town as it is, somebody will come up to me in the grocery store or the mall. I don't think I'd ever seen them before, and they'll say, uh, Dr. Holland, you saved my life back eight or ten years ago. Sometimes that's a, a little bit of an exaggeration. Sometimes it's true. Uh, it makes up sometimes for those calls that you get about 2 a.m. or Christmas Eve or Thanksgiving Day, there's a ruptured aneurysm or a dissection, and you know you have to get up and leave. But the greatest compliment, I think, the one that means the most to me, I was working with a, a grad uh, from Loma Linda. He had come through several years after I had, uh, and we were, we were just getting to know each other. And he said, he wanted to know where I was. 
uh, when I trained and so forth, and I told him. And then he paused and he said, so you were one of Wareham's boys. Thank you. I have known and worked with Dr. Wareham altogether for about 35 years. So I have a lot of story can tell you for hours, but I just want to share you the humorous side of Dr. Wareham. Dr. Wareham always tell people, the hospital I work, that Dr. Huang was, my, was the last fellow I recruit, and after that, the medical school decided to make me, let me go. One day, Dr. Worm told me that he and Barbara were 15 years apart. And so before they got married, some of Barbara's friends and relatives had warned Barbara that he could have become a widow before she turned 60. And Dr. Worm told me, but Lou, do you know, all those people told her that I outlive every one of them. <laughs> As you already know, Dr. Worm was on the Oprah show. And Oprah asked Dr. Worm, so what is your secret to live such a long, healthy life? And Dr. Worm responded, well, I don't hang around with old people. <laughs> Dr. Worm also liked to joke around with the young people. One of our OR nurse was getting married. And Dr. Worm said to him, you know, I never realized what the happiness is until I got married. But then it was too late. He also liked to joke about his age. One day, Dr. Laughlin, we all worked together as a partner, saw him that he was walking very fast to the OR. And Dr. Laughlin said, Dr. Worm, how come you're walking so fast? And Dr. Worm said, Larry, I'm not walking fast. I am just kept falling forward. <laughs> and out there, <clears throat> One day, Dr. Worm told me that there's one thing he's most proud of himself. And that was in his career, he had trained 24 cardiothoracic surgeons. And he said every one of them all turned out to be a very good surgeon, and he's very proud of it. And that goes to see our Dr. Worm is a true scholar and educator. However, he forgot to include all of the Chinese doctors from Beijing. In 1983, when I was at Loma Linda doing my fellowship, there were quite a few Chinese doctors. They were brought over from Fu Wai Hospital from Beijing to Loma Linda for cardio, uh, cardiac surgery training. Some of them are thoracic surgeons, never done cardiac surgery before, some of them are anesthesiologists, pulmonologists, cardiologists, and intensive care unit nurses. And after one year, another group, another group came. And that Fu Wai Hospital today is the number one heart center in China. Not only that, they perform 13,000 cardiac surgery procedure a year. You heard that right. 13,000 cases a year. They also become a major center, training center for cardiac surgeon and cardiologist. And that all because Dr. Wareham planned the seat back then. And today, thousands and thousands of the patients in China still benefit from it. One day I asked Dr. Wareham, when would you consider to retire? And Dr. Warren said, Lou, 
you know, the problem is if I retire, Barbara is going to make me clean up the garage. <laughs> and all the, <clears throat> one day uh, we finished surgery early. And that was just a few weeks before Dr. Warren retired at the age of 95. And we finished surgery early, and so I took him to this Chinese vegetarian restaurant in Alhambra. And during the dinner, I asked Dr. Worm, do you have one thing that you always want to do but haven't had a chance to do it? Because I thought it's about time that he do something for himself. And Dr. Worm thought for a moment. He couldn't think of anything. So instead, he asked me, do you mean that if I can start over again, what would I do? And I said, no, that's not exactly what I meant. But why don't you go ahead and ask that question anyway? Dr. Warren said, if I can start over again, I want to be a general surgeon. And I was really surprised because he had accomplished so much in cardiac surgery. Why he want the chance to be a cardiac surgeon, uh, a general surgeon? So Dr. Dr. Warren explained, as you know, to do open heart surgery, you need a team. You need all kind of specialists and also very uh, expensive equipment and facility. But if I were a general surgeon, I can go to any part of the world and serve missionary. So when I heard that, I have tears in my eyes. Here standing, sitting in front of me was a 95 years old man, and there's a one thing, and one thing only in his mind is to serve others. So <clears throat> Dr. Worm, you know, if you look it up, dictionary, every word describes a good character, good quality of a person, they all apply to Dr. Wareham. Dr. Wareham is our role model. Dr. Wareham is our mentor. And he will forever be remembered. He will always live in our hearts. I'll just wear them, my, my memories. It was in uh, the mid-1960s that uh, Marty and I were classmates in seventh grade at Los Angeles grade school, knowing that we'd lose a few members of our classmates because the school was moving from the city in Los Angeles to the farm in Loma Linda. Marty moved, I did not. My family moved five years later. Here's Dr. Wareham in 1966, along with Varner Johns, both of them leading surgery and internal medicine uh, in cardiology services. My wife got to know Dr. Wareham actually before I did. She was a student nurse uh, in the 1970s. She had a special day assigned in which she was going to witness cardiac surgery. She had never met Dr. Wareham before. But she learned that there was a relationship between Dr. Wareham and Dr. Hughes. Um, and she was in this operating room, and Dr. Hughes was operating, and Dr. Wareham started to scrub. And he scrubbed in, he walked over to the heart, and he looked up at Wilford, and he looked down at the heart, and he says, Wilford, is that the heart? <laughs> and my wife, Donna, was on a st stand there, and she looked over at the nurse and said, do you think we should be here? Do you think we should be witnessing this travesty of health care? She gets later, let's get to know her better. My memories stem from a trip in uh, Saigon in 1974, where I was fortunate enough to be part of the heart team, as pictured here. Um, it was on that trip that we did operate on uh, about 60 uh, children with, and uh, young adults who had congenital heart disease, life-limiting diseases whose lives were forever changed because of the presence of the heart team. It would be 35 years later that we were contacted by a young, four, by the, who was 14 when she had her surgery, holding the IV bottle there, her name was Wynne. She had spent a lifetime trying to find the American doctors who saved her life back in 1974. She was advised to contact Loma Linda. I got a chance to read the email. She says, is it possible that you were here in 1974 doing open heart surgery on people? And I said, yes, are you in this picture? And I sent this picture to her. And she said, yes, I'm the one holding the IV bottle. She says, you know, I cut hair in Victoria, Canada. Uh, and I'd love to have you come up and give you and Dr. Wareham a haircut. 
Well, we flew up there uh, because why not? Why would we pass a free haircut? And, uh, and a really good story. And we got off the plane, and Dr. Wareham, uh, about 94 years of age at this point, um, uh, when, they, when they said people need extra time to get on the airplane, Dr. Wareham never needed extra time to get on a plane. He could get on a plane. He could do everything, age 94. This picture was snapped, and unknowingly, I didn't realize this picture would be made very meaningful to me because I was going back through some old pictures in 1974 when we went to Vietnam together, and here we are getting off a plane. Uh, 40 years or 35 years earlier in styles of coats that I'm glad we don't wear anymore. Um, but Dr. Wareham first met and uh, when and she got the first got to meet again the doctor who took care of her 35 years before outside the airport in Victoria, Canada and there they hugged for the first time. Quite a meaningful reunion. Uh, doctor and patient 35 years after doing a ventricular septal defect repair. He saw her scar. She had been complicated by an infection in the sternum, uh, and we were very frightened. And we, we sort of reconstructed this story later. That we were very frightened that she had this wound infection, was still the only patient left in the hospital when the team, team left. But we went on walks with her 94-year-old surgeon, uh, and yes, she did uh, cut Dr. Wareham's hair. He asked, though, for a reduction in cost since he didn't have as much hair as I did. Uh, <laughs> always looking to not part with the dime. <laughs> But you know, this is an important part of Loma Linda's history because here in 1974, three people who made up the heart team, the core of the heart team, Dr. Judith Wareham and, and Coggin, had a chance 40 years later to take this same picture. Uh, and what is very interesting about this picture is these three people all passed away in the year 2018. Dr. Wareham, uh, we also had the opportunity to celebrate his 100th birthday. That was right here on the Loma Linda campus. Uh, many people showed up to, to um, honor this incredible feat. Here are some of the surgeons that were talked about. These are the people he trained. These are masters in their field, people who made life-changing um, uh, discoveries. Now, Dr. Wareham became famous for being old. Uh, here he is with Mars Jaton and Dan Butner. Dan Butner was the author of The Blue Zone. And it was interesting, while we were up in the airport in Victoria with Dr. Wareham, uh, my wife looked over and saw this gentleman waiting for the same plane and reading the book, The Blue Zone. He was more than two-thirds of the way through the book, and she went up to him, I see, see you're reading The Blue Zone. He says, yes. He said, did you read the chapter on Ellsworth Wareham? Oh, yes, I did. Amazing, amazing story. And she says, would you like to meet him? Could I? What do you mean? Do you know him? Well, he goes, just sitting right over here. And it's like he was, it's like he was the rock star. I mean, it was just every, so he couldn't believe that he was meeting the famous, famous Dr. Dr. Wareham. You know, one Green Planet about four years ago came out within eight inspiring people proved that a plant-based diet may be secret to age-defying vitality. And so, you, you know, number two is Christy Binkley. Uh, number four is Michelle Pfeiffer. And in that same category is number five, Dr. Ellsworth Wareham. <laughs> now, <laughs> Now, you wonder, were there any other men? Yes, there was one other man, a 79-year-old bodybuilder, but he was number eight, Jim Morris. <laughs> but, you know, he said something, you know, that picture that I just showed Dr. Wareham. Um, he said something. I thought, you know, this really says to people what Dr. Wareham is, because, as you recall, that one picture showed up in the front page of the New York Times because McDonald's wanted to open up a franchise restaurant in Loma Linda, and there was also a school of preventive health. You know, they went crazy about why would we ever allow fast food, saturated fat pal paradise? Why would we ever let that part of Loma Linda? And Dr. Wareham says, hey, hey, as far as I'm concerned, they built it next to the church because this is a free country. And um, he, he would, um, this is the picture, and he said, they can put it right next to the church as far as I'm concerned, Dr. Wareham added. If they choose to eat that way, I'm not going to stop them. That's the great American citizen. You know, Dr. Wareham um, did make one comment to me. Uh, he says, because he became very popular, you know, with the article in the New York Times in the, in the Blue Zone. He says, you know, he says, you know, Roger. You know, he looked at you through the trifocals. Remember that? He says, you know, Roger. He said, I'm making more money being old than I did as a cardiac surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one, there's one last thought. This is a picture I took when he was 100 years old. You know, I couldn't, I saw him walking away. I said, Dr. Worm, come here, you gotta. I never called him Ellsworth. I called him, Dave, did you call him Ellsworth? Nah, he's Dr. Worm. 
yeah. Um, I said, Dr. Wayne, I want to take a picture. I, I, let's, let's do a selfie. And I started talking to him, and it surprised me, and I haven't heard anybody speak about it. He said something that he'd never said before. I never heard him say it since. We were talking about uh, the overseas heart team, and he says, you know, Roger, he says, if I had to do it all over again, I don't think I would do it. He says, we took too many risks. He says, we took too many risks. And I said, but Dr. Wareham, I said, Dr. Wareham, think of the lives you changed. He says, it was, it was too risky, Roger. And I, I just, it, it just helps me. You know, he said that. But it just helps me in this next picture that I snapped in Vietnam. You know, here's a kid whose life was forever changed. Dr. Wareham, just like when. And undeniably, undeniably, with Barbara's help, the world is a better place because Dr. Wareham's life was well lived. What an honor it is for me to be a part of this service. My connection with the Wareham family goes back quite a while as Julie's first grade teacher was my mother. And so we've had a bit of a connection, but we're here to celebrate this life and it has been well celebrated and uh, wonderful that, that Roger has all those pictures to illustrate the, the story and the things that have been shared. I wanna thank Barbara for sharing with me a basket full of books, papers, handwritten papers, and uh, Bibles that uh, Dr. Wareham had. He had, she counted, Barbara says, 20 Bibles that he had. Many of them were well marked up. And I have one of them. This is a Andrews University study Bible that wasn't printed it was published in 2010, but it's amazing how marked up this Bible is and in this tiny little handwriting that uh, uh, Martin talked about, that some of it I had to use a magnifying glass to be able to read some of the notes that he had in the margin and around. But what a privilege it was for me to get acquainted with him in a broader way. And I hope to convey to you, primarily in his own words, the, uh, what he was like spiritually. And uh, he deeply loved his Lord and the Bible and the devotional writings of Ellen White. And every day he spent time reading in them. And in the Bible he had, in the margin, he has sometimes a date. For instance, 3-12-14, 7-20 a.m. And he has the time by it as well. Or 2-12-2-2-11 at 1-57 a.m. He had written there. Some of those, I think, were ones that he memorized when he had memorized. Others it was when he read it, and uh, uh, several places he had the date, and then he had Randy Roberts by it. So it was probably a text that uh, Pastor Randy, who's filling in for Dr. Hart this morning uh, because of canceled flights, uh, and it was uh, several places that he had marked there that he had heard. But there were two dominant themes that I found in some of these markings here. One is that Christians would face trials and difficulties, and the other is how we should live as Christians. And the first is in the introduction, I'll just share a, a couple of verses or, or incidents where, that illustrate those points. The first about trials and difficulties. In the book of Colossians, at the introduction to it, he wrote, think of Paul's optimism under adverse circumstances, in prison, facing death. That's how he was characterizing Paul's attitude in the book of 
Colossians. And in James, he highlighted and underlined in red, James 1, 2, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And in a paperback <clears throat> New International Version that he had with him in Saudi Arabia, because the address was there, he had lots of notes, and it, it was a New International Version. And at the top of the title page, he wrote, in his little tiny handwriting, read often, and then he had the reference, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, which says, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. He again highlighted this verse in this Bible, and at the end of it, where 1 Thessalonians end, there was some blank space, and he drew a line over to it, and he had a little outline there that uh, at the end of the book, he quotes the New International Version, give thanks in all circumstances. And then he begins the outline with Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those who love God. And then he quotes from Ellen White. The, this command, in everything give thanks, is an assurance that even the things which appear to be against us will work for our good. That was his attitude. And he had some quotes from... Abraham Lincoln and William James that filled out that little outline. The other theme, how Christians should live. There are two verses I just want to share with you on that. In Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. And then Titus 3, 2, speak evil of no one, be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Now, doesn't this sound a little bit like Dr. Wareham? He was kind, he was gentle. He was humble and tender-hearted. When I asked Julie to sum up her dad in one word, she thought just briefly and said he was humble. And then she went on to illustrate it by saying people would come up to him and said, you saved my father's life, or you saved my life. And Dr. Worm would deflect that compliment by saying, if I didn't do it, someone else would have done the surgery in a, a very humble way. And an example of his humility is found in some of the papers that Barbara shared with me. The commencement address that Dr. Wareham gave in 1971 to Andrews University graduates. And in that he had apparently received an honorary degree preceding his address. And he began by saying, your conferring upon me an honorary degree is an award personally unmerited. And he had that underlined personally unmerited, but I shall accept your very gracious offer in the name of the members of the Loma Linda University Heart Team. Its members have arduously labored at home and abroad, and because of the blessings of God and their teamwork, we have succeeded. Again, deflecting the attention from himself and sharing it with the whole heart team. One of his favorite books, Barbara says, was The Ministry of Healing. He had several copies, and they're well-worn and well-marked up. One copy that is coming apart that's dated below his name, October 3, 1938, 
he has written on the flyleaf that confirms Julie's evaluation of him as humble. He quotes, without giving any credit, make me charitable of the faults of others. Remember your own weaknesses, which are as the sands of the sea. And then beneath that, he has quoted, humility is a virtue. Well, he had a goal in life, as Dr. Wong shared, and his goal was to serve his Lord, to share him in the gospel, and to serve others. Barbara says he really wanted to be a missionary, but in reality, he was all around the world a missionary for his Christ and for good health. In, his, in this commencement address that I had the privilege of reading, after discussing the value of a college education to the graduates, he examined three lives and expanded upon them, Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Edison, and W.K. Kellogg. And then he summed up three characteristics that made them successful and made them great. They had a goal in life, they worked hard toward that goal, and they persevered. And those, I think, are three characteristics that made Dr. Wareham great as well. He concludes his commencement address with a story, a portion of which is on the back page of your program. On the wall of Congressman Pettus' office in Washington, and Jerry Pettus was our congressman at that time from here, on the wall is the following statement by Calvin Coolidge. Nothing in this world will take the place of perseverance. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistency and determination are omnipotent to our all-powerful. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. Perseverance was one of the outstanding characteristics of Dr. Wareham. He persevered in working hard, as you've heard, up into his upper 80, 90s. He practiced what he preached. And in another paper that J Jason shared, uh, I had the privilege of, of reading that before you, and he summed up his life this way, the joy and zest in life is to be moving ahead, having a goal to accomplish, a project to complete in an ideal way. And then he talked about making the ranch ideal, uh, painting, planting flowers, having a fine lawn, uh, making, resurfacing the asphalt. But he goes on, speaking of my total lifespan, finish strong, very strong. Strong in being a real Christian. Strong in doing right because it is right. Polish up those rough places of character. Avoid the critical attitude. See the desirable qualities in everyone. Exude good cheer, hope, optimism, concern, friendliness, love for others. These, of course, are fruits of the Spirit, he added. But wow, what a prescription for life. And yet that was, I think, his prescription for his life. Reflecting again on my joy in living, he goes on, my morale. It is important as I see it now that I assiduously avoid just lying like a boat in the water, just drifting and rocking with the waves. And so he worked till 95 in assisting in surgery. The way to meet the storms is to be under full power, 
That's the way the ship is controlled. One must man maintain an active, even zestful approach to many projects. Here his naval uh, experience came out. And then he ends, dispense with fear and timidity and indecision. For God, he quotes Second Timothy, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And then again in the next chapter, therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. When his granddaughter Heather graduated from high school, he sent her a Bible. And in that Bible, he wrote this letter. And we had the privilege of seeing the draft that he, he uh, wrote first. Dear Heather, this book, the Bible, <clears throat> is the most valuable object in this world. He has that underlined. It is the mighty God who created and rules the universe speaking to us. Without the Bible, we would not know what God is like, his thoughts, where he came from, what his plans for us are, how much he loves us, and how we are to live happy, rewarding lives in this troubled, mixed-up world. The Bible tells us why we are in all this trouble and how it will be solved. It alone tells the future. One thing in this world is certain. We will all die except the people who live to see Jesus comes. And he adds in parentheses, maybe you will be one of these. The Bible tells us how we may get the most precious and valuable of all gifts, eternal life. Not life as we know it now, but under such ideal conditions that we cannot imagine how good it will be. By reading about Jesus who took human form, we can know what God the Father is like. Anyone who has seen me, Jesus said, has seen the Father. Every day, read this book and pray to God to help you understand it. Follow its advice and your life will be happy and successful for it is advice of the God who made us. And when this life is over and Jesus comes again, you will enter into a most glorious existence where you can talk with God and not just read about him. And this pretty much sums up Dr. Wareham's philosophy on life and our words for not just Heather, but for all of us today. And at the end, he put this reference, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, which is a, a great passage that I have often used at funerals. Paul says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This is the legacy that Dr. Wareham left for the world, for his family, and for each of us. The words in the book of Revelation are certainly true for him. Blessed are the dead 
who die in the Lord from now on, yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Dr. Wareham is resting from his labors, but his works certainly do follow him. His back was bent and weary, his voice was tired and low. His sword was worn from battle, his steps had gone slow. He used to walk on water, for it seemed that way. I know he moved some mountains, but never. Strike up the band, assemble the choir. Another soldier is coming. Another warrior hears the call. He's waited for. of sorrow his heart knew no defeat he walked in narrow places knowing Christ knew no defeat and as his steps turned homeward so much closer than the prize he sounded kind of homesick and there was longing in his eyes The soldiers come in.
wow, what a privilege to be here. What a privilege to have had Dr. Wareham in our lives. Please join me in a prayer of thanksgiving. Father, we are here honoring the memory, celebrating the life of one of your very special beloved sons. Thank you, Father, for making our world better by giving us Ellsworth Wareham. Not just the world in general, that's true, but our individual worlds. And I think of your beloved daughter, precious Barbara, and sons and daughter and grandchildren, all of whom will proceed into their lives against the backdrop of Dr. Ware. Yes, we miss him. Each of us does in her or his own way. And we will. But it occurs to me, Father, that you miss him too. As we've just learned through Pastor Retzer, you, Father, and your beloved son, Wareham Ellsworth, were thick. And there's no question in my mind, or any of our minds, that he spent a lot of time with you. And you miss that. But you know how everything is going to turn out. And because of the thick relationship you had, you know Ellsworth Wareham is going to be in the first resurrection. And he will arise as a young man with the full vim and vigor of life and an eternity before him. Thank you for these memorial times when we can remember and when we can get a new look at what makes your beloved children like Ellsworth Wareham who they are. And as just been quoted, their works follow them. May we faithfully, Father, pick up the banner of Dr. Wareham's life so that it will continue to fly to a continuing world, I don't know, however long you will. So, again, just a big thank you, God, for Dr. Wareham and for his family and for all those people who his mind and his heart and his hands you assisted to give life. So, thank you for this day, this experience, through Dr. Wareham's Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are all invited, as you see in the program, to Wong Curley. And Pastor Retcher and I are going to ask your kindness to allow us to take Miss Barbara and the family over on the way to Wong Kar Lee and you can greet them, share some of your memories, and spend some time together with them there. So thank you for permitting us to do that.